Greaker. Yeah, thank you. My name is Mats Greaker. I'm from I'm a researcher at Statistics Norway. I think maybe there was a bit misunderstanding between Trovik and Hittelsen, as I understood, because as I understood you, Hittelsen, you were talking about uh, environmental and health effects in Norway, direct effects in Norway of importing GM uh, uh, herbicide tolerant uh, GM uh, soy or uh, or uh, or corn, and as far as I've understood so far, there are I, I've understood the discussion. The direct environmental effects in Norway are not very big, and I think for the group it's very important to keep this separate that we have the effects abroad and the effects in Norway. And the effects in Norway has to be sort of, uh, in a way, direct. Uh, that I think is very important. And if we're talking about uh, effects abroad uh, of of the of the of the growing, I think it is. I think it's also very important to evaluate whether a trade measure is the right kind of measure in order to do to do something to the sustainability abroad. As was mentioned as well by Kittelsen, because. Uh, uh, a trade measure from Norway doesn't have any, it will have very little effect on, on the practices outside Norway at all, maybe other, uh, and, uh, and it will cost Norway. So maybe if those money were spent in another way, it would have a much bigger uh, impact on practices abroad. So that I think is a very valuable input to the discussion that if we're talking about environmental and health effects or unsustainable effects outside Norway, then maybe not a trade measure is the correct measure. Then I, I would like uh, Tori Krutta, if you could give the microphone, because I think it was, yeah, Tori Krutta. Uh, I have a question for Kor. Uh, how old are these uh, WTO rules that uh, you are referring to? Did they came to being before um, uh, these uh, GMOs were produced the first time, or can they came afterwards? And. Um, I also wonder, I have a question for uh, Heide at uh, the Norwegian Directorate for Nature Management. And that, I have uh, wondered, why on earth did you uh, recommend these, uh, these uh, GMOs? And uh, could you please, uh, uh, before you sent this letter to uh, the Norwegian, uh, the, yeah, whatever they were, uh, what uh, kind of arguments did you come up with internally? The two main arguments that uh, you you had to, which uh, made you uh, go for this decision, I, I'm sure that you had a lot of uh, negative uh, things about GMO, but what was the positive things that you came up with that uh, made you come forward with, with this uh, catastrophe uh, uh, thing? Thank you. Cora. First and then the rules are very old. Actually, they predate WTO when we had a gap. It's the same rules and are now carried over to WTO. So I think it must have been 1948 or 49 or something like that. Long before GMOs were, were known. Yeah. But uh, uh, I just want to comment on that. Yeah. Just very short. Yeah. I think uh, there is something uh, very. There is something very. Uh, something important is missing in the WTO rules. Uh, because um, uh, these GMOs and uh, when you take uh, vi uh, genes from viruses and uh, bacteria and you put into our food system, uh, they were never considered when these rules were made, right? So I think uh, a good thing for the Ministry of Foreign Relations would be to take up uh, towards the VTO is that uh, you need some uh, new rules. And uh, maybe you can look into that. But with the current rules, you can still deal with GMOs. You can make the case that they are different from non-GMO products, that's what we are saying. But then the point is, we have to make the case and come up with the evidence. Changing the rules will be much more difficult than making the case within the existing rules. Uh, so are the Rambjör Heide? Yes, thank you. I discussed the question with Mr. Kruvitor during the break, but I could uh, repeat my answer, and that is our recommendation to the Ministry of Environment is publicly available and uh, the case is now discussed within the government so it's not correct for me to make any comments on that at this stage. Thank you. But why can't you tell us why, why you... Uh, what is the main reason? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so we have a Valborg Kvakista. I regard that more as a comment, uh, Kvartista. Mm -hmm. uh, then I have uh, Thomas Bøhn and Hoslev Eide. I would like to mention the German ban on MOM 810 BT maze. Uh, that maze was approved in Germany in 1998 and later re-approved in 2005. And uh, being a researcher with uh, Daphne Magna as a model, the tests that showed no harm for these uh, approvals, it was a 48-hour test with adult uh, Daphne that had uh, perfect food and lived in the laboratory and were fed for 48 hours with pollen, BT pollen from on 18 maize. The size of a pollen from maize is 90 micrometers and Daphne Magna has a maximum size of food particles at 50 micrometers, so it's not possible for the animal to eat on uh, the pole, <laughs> and it would survive almost everything for 48 hours anyway. <laughs> but in 2009, it was a ban of MON A10 maize based on a couple of laboratory studies that showed a negative effect on uh, survival, growth, and fecundity. And one of these studies came from our lab in uh, Tromsø that showed uh, a significant decline in, uh, in survival and also growth and fecundity effects. Uh, the German government, they decided to have the ban not because of real harm but potential harm, arguing that uh, Germany had a precautionary approach and a potential harm was better to use uh, to ban on a 10 than to wait for the real harm. Uh, I think it's very interesting how the scientific community has uh, responded to, for example, the article that uh, I was the first author on, on this BT maze. It has been uh, heavily criti criticized and, for example, it is uh, a peer-reviewed article in transgenic research criticizing that article, saying that how can they uh, conclude like they do when they have not measured the amount of BT toxin in the feed. That is a pure lie. We measured exactly the amount of BT toxin in the feed. It was 67 plus minus 27 nanograms of, uh, of BT toxin, cry1AV. So that is uh, one thing that was criticized. Another was that uh, we measured survival over, over 42 days in uh, the experiment. And they recommended that it should be only for 14 days or maximum 21 days. <laughs> if you look for survival, you would like to have a long-term study, not a short-term study. So I think that it's quite interesting to see how the scientific uh, discussion go on around these uh, issues. Uh, I could also mention that uh, among these maize uh, varieties that uh, the Norwegian government had not uh, been able to conclude on, the other one, Terry mentioned the NK603, the other one is the T25 maize. It is resistant to both glyphosate and glyphosinate ammonium, which is a chemical that uh, Norway is not going to use and the whole Europe is going to ban in, uh, in the future. It has been banned for a long time except in uh, a little bit of apple production in Norway. 
So I find it a bit surprising that uh, it's not picked up by more or less uh, everyone that it is a serious uh, risks with uh, these two maize varieties. Thank you. Would you like to comment on that, or or you you just uh, I think did just you take the no next? Case. Yeah, and then I have uh, Vuslev Aida. to introduce myself the last time I had the word. I'm Trine Rosserweide from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences in Moss, and uh, I teach biotechnology. Um, to the, the last, uh, the last uh, comment from, from Genex Center, this, this uh, BT uh, toxin and, and uh, all the BT products that are on the market are so complicated that when, when uh, I teach my students, I ask them to do a, a whole uh, thesis on, on that subject because the, the, the literature is vast uh, and in general I am very skeptical to any laboratory experiment. I much prefer the field tests that are being done properly performed. Whether they tell one thing or the other thing is not, uh, that doesn't matter to me. The ma what matters most is that it's done under real conditions. Well that's not what I wanted to say, <laughs> talk about. I wanted to, d to raise the question um, since I have also worked in the Ministry of Environment a long time ago when the green technology law was, was uh, brand new, uh, I know a little bit about the discussions that go on between the ministries on whether to say yes or no to applications that come from the EU. And, and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at, at the time were very concerned about our uh, European economic <coughs> agreement. And, and that if we said no all the time for this or that reason, um, that could jeopardize the whole ES, uh, EA agreement. Um, so at that time, we, we didn't discuss WTO that much, uh, but the, the relations to EU, I'd like to have the comments on, on the current situation on that. Would you like to go for that, keep us Well, then, shortly, that, that is. <laughs> I don't know the details, I'm not directly involved, but I understand that there are, we, we do have a, for one thing, we do have a, um, a special a adaptation of the, of um, one of the directives, uh, the, the directives from the EU, uh, and we're negotiating with the EU on how to handle the second part of this. This is beyond me, I, frankly, I am not, I'm not, I'm not neither, I'm not an EU specialist, uh, but I understand that there is negotiation going on there. The, 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 the whole general question of whether it uh, would jeopardize or not, so the, uh, <coughs> uh, when we would jeopardize or not our, our agreement with the EEA, that's a, a long political discussion that I'm sure we all could take part in, but I don't think it's appropriate for me as a civil servant to do that now. Uh, I have Aina Bartman. Yeah, I start without the microphone. I represent the Norwegian Farmers Organization, and I can just say for sure, I think that uh, uh, I don't think I don't think we will grow GMOs in our way in our generation. I'm quite sure of that when I know the farmers. Um, first of all, I think we can all agree that we need more research on the long-term impacts uh, by using GMOs and uh, that research should be independent, should have no economical strings attached. And so we are very happy that we have GENAC in our way. So we are important in that way, we are important. But I think this a bit confusing uh, debate is whether we as Norwegians, uh, Norwegians uh, should be forced to operate with double standards because we won't grow GMOs in our way, but um, should we then just accept other countries to do it, even if we are worried about the long-term impacts? That is what this is about. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's impossible to discuss uh, sustainable development and just uh, say this is within the Norwegian borders. It makes no sense to discuss it in that way. And we are very proud of our Norwegian gene technology law, but if you say it stops at Svinnesund, I mean, then we don't have a Norwegian law that we could be proud of. So, uh, 
you said, Martin Kord, what are the possibilities within the WTO? And I agree fully with you, and we should do our homework to, to try if someone challenges us. But it's not a red flag. It's just about um, uh, worrying about people in other countries as well as we worry about our own health and, and uh, our own farmers and the environmental issues. So, so this is so important. We are so proud of the law, but if we can't use it on a global level, it's not a good law anymore. So I'm, I'm that simple in my head. <laughs> well, I want to try to answer again because uh, I'm arguing from the point of view that I admire the Norwegian law. I'm the promoter of the Norwegian law. I'm more than the promoter of the Norwegian law, but also the Norwegian knowledge, scientific knowledge, the whole paradigm. We even try to get things in Norwegian translated into, into English at our own cost to distribute to our governments. So I'm, I'm the champion of the Norwegian model because I, I have been trained by Norwegians, of course by other countries as well, to understand the science and the ecology of, of, of gene technology. So it is more than a case-to-case to case, uh, critique, it is of the paradigm itself, which is what has made us so worried. Now, coming back to, the, to, to this sustainability criteria, why I am in two minds. Because what we are saying is that the WTO is quite friendly to you if you are doing something in Norway. Even if you are doing something in Norway that is out of the normal in WTO, such as health and environmental and so on, into the area of ethics. And I, I, I take it even that even nature has its own ethics. In fact, there is a resolution moving in the United Nations on the rights of Mother Earth and how human beings should not trample on the rights of Mother Earth that you could use if you want to and therefore augment this argument even if you use uh, public morals. I think public morals is not morality as such but the belief of a, of a nation or a people and say that it's not a crazy Norwegian idea, it is also a UN resolution that nature has its own integrity and you can use it to justify why you ban, for example, GM production inside Norway and why you even try to ban things coming into Norway because this affects not only health and environment but larger than that. Okay? But if you try to then use the Norwegian values and even scientific knowledge and then try to impose it on others by saying that I don't like the way you are doing this and therefore because of that I am not importing your thing you are going to create such a huge uproar that it may backfire on your noble objective of changing the world and what I'm more worried is it may backfire on the Norwegian model for Norway because they will use it to challenge not only sustainability for other countries or sustain this is this is really uh, the dilemma that I put forward to you because you can still do it and you and you will you will definitely face a challenge in WTO definitely I can look at not only United States but Argentina Brazil and others challenging you for the principle you can try to defend it as in the tuna shrimp case but there is a much stronger likelihood that you will fail than if you use a science argument <clears throat> And therefore, we are talking about risk assessment. Okay? You have to apply the principles of risk assessment to the reputation of the Norwegian policy and law, which now enjoys very high reputation. Nobody questions that the Gene Technology Act is a disguised form of protectionism. They know that the science of biosafety is very advanced here, and that's why you have a very good law. But if you come out with something that gives a chance for somebody, a justifiable opportunity for somebody to say that you are doing this either for protectionist reasons or for something which is extraterritorial application of a Norwegian belief, then it may also contaminate that aspect of, of, of your work which is genuinely wonderful. So this is the thing I think that you need to risk, to, to weigh. Now does that mean that you should not worry about the world? Yes, you have, you should. But you can use other instruments, such as, that's why I started by saying, we have a training on biosafety 
and on why they should have this kind of policy in their country. Uh, you can have uh, scientific training of developing countries. You can even open a branch in the United States in order to educate the Americans. And you are probably going to be much more effective using those instruments than the trade instrument of import and the rationale that you are using for spreading sustainability to Africa or Brazil through the, through the trade measure route, which you should do through the, for example, if there's NORAD or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that is going to give uh, grants for Norwegians to help train people in developing countries on the Norwegian model of biosafety, that will be far more effective than using the trade, uh, the trade measure. Um, I think that Vuslev Eide raised a quite important uh, uh, issue compared to what you were saying about risk assessment. Uh, Trine, did I understand you correctly when you say that you didn't acknowledge lab tests like this compared to field trials? Because I thought that was rather revolutionary thoughts. I, I know. Uh, I will, I will uh, say a little bit more about it. I I think when it comes to the Bt toxin and, and making genetically modified uh, varieties, if you do the uh, test in the laboratory, they are always um, uh, not natural. You are you are forcing the feed on on the larvae, whatever way you do it, and whether it's 40 days or 42 days, 48 hours or 100 days, it doesn't really matter to me. I think. I'm a strong believer in going in, if, if you're looking at ecological issues, which this is, then you need to go into the field and do field tests and see, compare fields that have BT varieties with fields that are, have no BT varieties, with fields that are sprayed, mm -hmm. and, and then compare how the, the target and the non-target organisms mm -hmm. are affected. Mm -hmm. That is the only tests that I believe in when it comes to BT. And thank you for giving me the opportunity for making a more in-depth comment. And, uh, I thought I saw some hand from Thomas then. Just to finalize that uh, part of the debate before I just uh, make some conclusion in the office. Mm -hmm. I agree Shop completely one. that mm -hmm. the most interesting uh, or most uh, realistic would be field studies. <coughs> However, all scientists know that if you go into the field, then you introduce a complexity that you don't understand. So if you want to understand mechanisms and what really happens, then you have to go into the lab and you would like to go into the field. So I agree completely that uh, it's very interesting to see uh, what happens in the field, but you have to go into the lab as well to understand the details, to uh, understand, for example, dose response relationships and to understand one factor at a time. And then maybe, uh, ideally, how different factors may have antagonistic or synergistic effects, etc. Because in the field, you don't have control. So as a scientist, you have to go into the lab also. Thank you. Uh, Kittelsen, just a final short question. And that when you elaborated on public morale, you pointed out that in a democracy, so if we then should say that uh, as long as there is only not, not only one voice, this public morale would always be questionable. Was that correctly? Uh, did I understand you correctly? Well, but you have to be, what I tried to say was that you have to, when you use uh, when you try to de de uh, develop the fact that you do have a public morale mm -hmm. issue, that you have to persuade the other party on the other side of the table that this is something that is the whole community's or the whole nation's uh, attitude. And I know that it's impossible to say that there's only one. I mean, there is, as we say, a democracy. There will be always more than one voice. So I'm not saying that you need to have a unanimity, mm -hmm. but but I'm saying that there has to be a uh, a, a, like you a we all would think when we have ideas about hardcore pornography most of us are very strongly against it but there might be some people who still like it that doesn't that we would say that's a public morale issue yeah well, but uh, it's not illegal for them well we if but also we, we we most of us would say that that, that issue there are things that are n are legal that yeah. we would we would say we don't like um, and we know when we see it, but it's very difficult to do, define it. But I think we all know when we see it that there is a limit to, on, on where that, that starts. 
So it's but not it's, it's, I cannot give you the answer, no, say no. that it's 50% okay. or 20% or something like that. That's okay. impossible. Then I would really like to thank all of you for giving us good comments, giving us good questions, participating in answering the questions. And I really hope to see you on our next meeting, which is on the 27th of September, where we continue the discussion about uh, pesticides or herbicides. It's called the Norwegian Spreitemidler, Venn eller, Venn eller Fiende, where we da ser på uppföljningen uh, av vad som har skett inför detta fältet. I hope to see you there and um, welcome back and thank you for all your contributions. Thank you.